thanks for coming. This was all arranged very quickly. My brother, Richard Becker, lives in San Francisco. He's a lifelong activist and got started with the anti-war movement in the 60s. He originally published the book that he's talking about tonight in 2009, and this is a second edition with a timeline bringing us up to the present. It is updated, it has a new introduction, and um, he's just fresh from the People for Palestine National Conference in Detroit, which I heard was incredibly magnificent, and I'll let him tell you more about that since I wasn't there. <laughs> If I talk like this, I just I don't want to talk too long. Um, as uh, as Jill said, uh, I just came from the People's Conference for Palestine, which was close to 3,000 people in Detroit for three days, and there were pretty much 3,000 people there at the end, as at the beginning. Which, uh, for anyone who's been to conferences, know that's highly unusual, especially for a three-day conference. Uh, it was done in the great spirit of uh, unity and energy. Uh, and youthfulness, which is really great, and very, very youthful together. So, I would like to talk tonight about a, a little of the history, uh, as well as the, the contemporary situation. Um, you know, I, when we talk about this issue, there's often times, and I, I put this in the first book, the account of uh, George Mitchell, people remember George Mitchell as a senator from Maine, and he was a delegate to deal with Ireland, he was sent in. He was appointed by Barack Obama at the very beginning of his, Canada, his presidency to be a, a representative uh, to the U.S. on peace negotiations, so called, you know, between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. And at his introduction, he said, he tells this story, Mitchell tells this story, and the story is, he said, you know, I was dealing with a conflict that was 800 years old, and an elderly gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, oh, uh, uh, who was, who was uh, Israeli, and said, oh, only 800 years, no matter, no wonder you could solve the problem. Meaning something that is completely false. The implication being that this is some conflict that's been going on since 3,000 years ago or something like that. Which is a false representation, but one, unfortunately, most people in the United States think they believe that it is. In fact, it's completely not true. Uh, for one thing, uh, the Arab, uh, there was no Arab population 3,000 years ago in uh, what, is, uh, what is Palestine today. Uh, but also, it's you know, there were, the last Israelite kingdom went out of existence in about 561 BC, uh, according to the best estimates, which are all estimates when you go back that far in history. Really, the modern Zionist movement, which is a political movement, not a religious movement, and most of its founders were not religious at all, uh, uh, really began in, in the 1880s and announced itself to the world with the first World Zionist Congress that took place in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland. And the, the first World Zionist Congress, uh, it, it was coming at the issue uh, from a couple of contradictory different ways. One, it was a very real reaction to very real anti-Semitism in large parts of Europe and the Americas, uh, in the Russian Empire especially, but not just there. Theodore Herzl, the founder of the of movement, uh, or its founding leader, um, uh, had become so uh, due to his coverage of the trial of Theodore uh, of uh, Dreyfus, Lieutenant Dreyfus in France, who was framed up on an anti part of the French military and framed up on, a, on an anti Semitic basis. So it was, uh, but at the beginning, it was a very small movement in terms of support. Uh, it had the, the great majority of people who were Jewish activists at that time in the Europe or in the Americas, uh, whether they were socialists or they were liberal or something centrist or whatever, were, were fighting for equality in the states where they, where they were, where they lived. Uh, and they viewed uh, Zionism as a reactionary ideology. Um, 
The other side of the one, so on the one hand, it was a reaction to very real anti-Semitism in Europe, but on the other hand, it was from the beginning a European colonial movement. And how do we know that? I play, I, because the leader said so. And one of the things I did with the book is to try to show out of the mouths of the participants what the reality was. And, uh, and how do we know that Theodore Herzl would have this view? Because he said so. He wrote a famous letter to Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes was the architect of British imperialism and colonialism in Africa for the British. Uh, and uh, he said to, uh, to Rhodes, why am I writing this to you? It's not about Africa, because it is something colonial. And so from the very beginning, you have this contradiction of it's a reaction to racism and bigotry, but on the other hand, it had the typical European colonial movement view that really uh, none of the colonial movements, including the one that settled here, had any respect for the indigenous people, nor did they act there. It had an even bigger contradiction, though, actually, uh, if it could be bigger, and that was that it had no army and no navy. I mean, this is unlike any other colonial movement. How could you be a colonizing movement without an army and a navy, without a, an organized form of violence? Because, of course, no indigenous people would sort of willingly send, uh, surrender their, their land or their, you know, their areas to uh, colonizers. It was always accomplished by means of violence, uh, exclusively by means of violence. So you had this contradiction from the beginning. And the reason I'm talking about this is because in order then for, and this is very, this is very important right up until today and significant up until today, is that in order to overcome that problem of not having an army or a navy or a land to construct an army and a navy on, the Zionist movement had to find a sponsor. So the leadership of it, Herzl, who died in 1904, was succeeded by Chaim Weizmann, and they spent a great deal of their time over the next 20 years. They visited the Russian Empire, uh, as bad as the Russian Empire was, the German Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they made feelers to France. And finally, the empire that agreed to sponsor them was the British Empire, to sponsor their project. And this was announced in a letter on uh, uh, November 2nd, of 1917 by the British Foreign Secretary called the Belfort Declaration. How many people know the Belfort Declaration, what it is? And the Belfort Declaration said that the British government supports the creation of a national home, they called it, but everybody knew uh, what the real intention was, national home for Jewish people in Palestine, not to prejudice the rights of the already existing non-Jewish population which uh, was taken as uh, a, extremely insulting by the non-Jewish population. Uh, like, how come we don't, aren't even called Arabs? You know, we're, we just aren't people without a name. Uh, and, and so, but that was, that was the beginning. And it was under that sponsorship, and you know, I, we're not going to stay here all night, so I'm not going to start from 1917 and talk up until year by year. Um, but that was, uh, that was on that day. And five days later, interestingly, was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And what makes that significant and what fits in this story is that the, the Bolshevik Revolution's new foreign ministry published something called the Sykes-Picot Treaty. Anybody know what the Sykes-Picot Treaty was? Okay. Sykes-Picot Treaty is unknown, but you can go, if you go to the Middle East, and in Damascus, or in, in Cairo, or anywhere, and you talk to cab drivers, and ask them about the Sykes-Picot Treaty, they can tell you about it. Because the Sykes-Picot Treaty uh, is what created the modern Middle East, and the creation of the state, what would become the state of Israel, is integral to that, to the Sykes-Picot Treaty and the division. And what was the Sykes-Picot Treaty? In 1915, the British had sent an emissary, and this is in World War I. They're fighting the Ottoman Empire, or the, you know, it was the empires against the empire, German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire against the British Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire, the Italian Empire, the Japanese Empire. I mean, all these, uh, and you should, we should think about that. Really, were they really fighting for democracy? Make the world safe for democracy, as they often proclaim? Is that what empires do? 
Well, the British sent this envoy, uh, T.E. Lawrence, and some of the older people in the crowd, being in my age, you know, know that romantic movie, Lawrence of Arabia. Well, Lawrence of Arabia was an actual person, but he's not, and you get a little hint of it in the, in the, in the movie, but not much. But he went and he approached the leaders of the uh, uh, of the leaders of the nascent Arab national movement, which is emerging. Most of, most of the Arab world was under the domination of the Ottoman Empire at that time. And he said, if you, if, you stand, if you fight with us against the Ottoman Empire, we'll support your right to an independent state when it's all over. Instead, the next year, 1916, they met in secret, the British, French, Russian foreign ministries, and talked about how when the war was over, they would cut up the Middle East. They would divide up the Ottoman Empire among them. Uh, and so the British, the Bolshevik Revolution, when it came to power, published the treaty just a couple weeks later after the after the Belfort Declaration. They published the treaty and they said, we renounce this treaty. We have no territorial ambitions. Uh, this is a reactionary, terrible thing. But that's how the Middle East got divided. And so, and when the war was over, you know, people, the, the people in what is present day Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria met in 1919 in uh, in uh, Damascus, and it was called the General Syrian Congress, and they created a new country called the Arab Syrian Kingdom. And with a monarchy, it was a constitutional monarchy. In 1920, uh, 1921, the French army marched in and crushed it blood. Otherwise, there would have, that would have been a country down to, I think, a country down to today. And the whole history would have been a completely different history. But instead, the Ottoman Empire was carved up. The British got uh, uh, Jordan, which present-day Jordan, Palestine, Iraq, tightened their grip on Egypt, which they already had quite a grip on, and the French got Lebanon and Syria. And incorporated into this was, of course, the fact that the British were already promising to a European settler movement their support for a, 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 a state, a new state, even though they called it a national home, in what was the center, and what is really down to today, kind of the center of the Arab world. Uh, so this is the beginning. This is really the beginning of the modern, you know, and, 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 and I think it's worth saying because it's so ignored. Even very well-educated people uh, here in the United States, even people who are history majors and so forth, they don't know this, this history that led up till today. So that was 1917, was the Belfort Declaration and the revelation to the Arab world. There were rebellions all over the Arab world in 1920, great rebellions. Uh, and in Iraq, for instance, uh, it, it lasted for several months, 10,000 Iraqis were killed, 2,000 British troops were killed too, fighting them. But one, uh, one uh, point to make about that is that most of the British troops were not true, were not British, they were Indian. This is how they, you know, you, know that, you ever think about that little island? How did that little island control so much of the world? You know, the, where the sun never set in the British Empire. And, and uh, of course it's because they were the masters of the Vatican and conquer. Uh, so this was 1920, uh, rebellions all over, and there would be continual rebellions all over. Uh, and it's, and, but the door was open for settlement on a large scale. And uh, whereas in 1917, when the Belfort Declaration was issued, uh, the Jewish population of Palestine was about 8%. Uh, and so the Arab population, Christian and Muslim, uh, was about 92%. Uh, and most of the Jewish population of Palestine was against the Zionists. They viewed this as this is going to create conflict. The relations were fairly good, were, were pretty good, the relations between these different religious communities in, in Palestine. And they were opposed to it. So that was then. By, by 20 years later, uh, it had it run to about 30% of the population was settled, mostly settlers from Europe, some from Amer the Americas, but mostly from Europe. And by 1947, when the fateful vote came at the United Nations to partition Palestine, which had been a British colony, the British wanted to get out, their empire was falling apart, they had bigger fish to fry. Uh, 
Uh, but at that time, when, uh, at the time that that uh, uh, took place, the population was about 60%, 65% uh, Palestinian Arab, 35% uh, Jewish. And uh, the population of the, uh, uh, the British, uh, the way that the British ended it was by announcing a couple months before that they were going, uh, a few months before, there was a vote at the United Nations on November 29th, 1947. And the vote was by the narrowest of margins uh, to vote for partition. Uh, and at that time, that's a, a war broke out uh, between the Palestinians and between and the Palestinians and the Zionists, uh, and that, which led to the creation of the State of Israel. And seventy-eight percent of what had been the British mandate of Palestine, the colony, and twenty-two percent. But there was no Palestine anymore. Gaza was incorporated into European, uh, into Egyptian administration. And, Jordan, and the West Bank was, and East Jerusalem were administered by Jordan. Uh, so, what, but between between the, uh, the those two things, uh, the Balfour Declaration and the, the Partition Vote, of course, there were many other things that happened. In 1936, after years of, of conflict that was going on, there was a revolution, uh, which you talk about in the book. There was a revolution in Palestine, uh, and it lasted for three years. Uh, it started with six months of uh, six months of, of a general strike, the longest general strike in history, and then two two years of uh, of guerrilla warfare. Uh, but it was crushed in 1939. And 1939 is, of course, the year that World War II began in Europe. Uh, and and uh, one of the myths, and there's many, many myths about this conflict, which I think have been used to really deceive people and, uh, and confuse people, is that, and this was invoked after the war was over, that the leaders in the United States had great sympathy with the plight of Jewish people and what had happened in the Holocaust, <coughs> where millions and millions, six million Jewish people, millions more Slavic people, uh, the trade unionists, gay people, the, the Nazis wanted to wipe out all the disabled people. All of that, including what was happening to the Jewish people that everybody knew about in the late 30s, you couldn't avoid it. Uh, none of that really in, uh, added up to uh, the, in, the intervention that could have taken place and that could, save, could have saved many lives. Uh, for instance, the, in the, in the run-up to the war, uh, there was a, a law that was proposed called the Warner, uh, um, the, the Wagner Rogers Act. And the Wagner Rogers Act was a, uh, it called for 20,000, this was in 1939 40. Uh, it called for 20,000 Jewish children who were refugees to be admitted to the United States who were not, par uh, aside from the quota, there was this, you know, this terrible racist quota system for immigration. That was not supported, it did not pass in the US Congress, and, and Roosevelt wouldn't get behind it at the time. When the war was going on, the killing that was going on in the, in the concentration camps was killing on an industrial scale. And I say that because the people were being brought into the camps uh, in boxcars, and in many cases went right into the, uh, to the gas chambers. So there was an appeal that was made by people, including Henry Morgenthau, who was the only Jewish member of Roosevelt's cabinet. And he made an appeal, he, he, and he, he and others appealed to uh, the, U, the US and the British to slow down, at least slow down the, the pace of killing. I mean, killing at an industrial scale implies industry, right? And the main industry that was facilitating this mass murder on that scale was uh, the railroads. So there was an appeal made to bomb the rail lines leading into the camps. Even if it killed some people, destroying the rail lines would slow down at least the rate of killing that was going on. And it was rejected by the commanders, by the, the top leaders as not, being, not fitting in with what their strategic plan was. This is at a time when thousands of, of planes would be flying on a daily basis, dropping bombs. I mean, US and British planes. So this was, uh, you know, it was afterwards when 
The U.S. government, for its own reasons, after a great deal of debate, decided to support the partition plan and the division uh, of, of the colony of Palestine into, into what was supposed to be two states. When the uh, vote was passed, uh, and it was only, it had to have two thirds, and we should remember what the UN was at that point in history. Uh, uh, virtually none of Africa was in the United Nations. Uh, they were all colonies. Much of Asia was colonies. Uh, Latin America was totally dominated still by the United States, by, and much of it still is today. But so it was really, and the vote was an illegal vote. I mean, there was no consultation with the people who were being partitioned. Uh, they, they just sat in New York and they, they did this. So war broke out immediately. And the war that broke out immediately uh, was one where you have to take into account that the, the Palestinian side had just been defeated and its revolution had been crushed. And, it was illegal for Palestinians to own weapons. Uh, owning a stick was punishable by 10 days in jail. I uh, understood oh, having a knife was 10 years in jail. I mean, they were in a very, very weakened state. But what's really important to the, to the story is how then, how, how did it come to be that these two states would end up the way that they did end up? Meaning that in the area of the Palestine man mandate that was occupied, uh, that was turned over to the Zionists and what would become the state of Israel, about 600,000 people were, uh, were Palestinian. And the leaders of, uh, of the, uh, the Zionist movement and what would become the state of Israel uh, did not want this. And we talk about this in the book, it's very well documented that, and, and this is one of the things we try to do with the book, is to show out of their own, what they say themselves. They said, we, uh, a, common, a common sentiment is, we are not of the Orient, we are of the Occident. Meaning, we're from the West, we're not part of the Middle East, we're not part of where we want to create the state. We do not, uh, you know, that, and they, they use all kinds of language, which I'm not going to say here, but the various leaders about this, about, and, and uh, they wanted to clear their state of the population. So what was happening early in the war was that the Zionists were much better armed and funded, and the Palestinians were coming out of defeat. Uh, and the, uh, the Zionist military forces had been incorporated into the British war machine. Uh, when it was when World War II was going on, they would win most of the battles. That is, the Zionists would win most of the battles, but they were very unhappy, quickly unhappy with what the results were, because the population there'd be a battle near a village. The the, battles, the Zionists didn't win all the battles by any means, but they won a lot of them. And uh, the, but the population wouldn't go away. The population would go to the next village over, or the village after that. And the decision was made that this was unacceptable, that this was not the state that they were fighting for, that they wanted a state that was an exclusive state. And, and that state, uh, in, in order for that state to come into being, the population had to be moved. The Palestinian Arab population had to be moved. And the way it was moved uh, was through something called Plan Dalet. And Plan Dalet, Dalet is, I believe, the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So there have been three plans before. This was Plan de Let. And Plan de Let really announced itself to the world, and what it really was, was on April 9th of 1948, and that was the massacre that was carried out at Deir Yassin. Deir Yassin was a village of a little, small village on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and the entire population was, was wiped out, uh, with a couple of, of exceptions. And it was carried out by one of the three Zionist military groups, this one being the Irgun. And the Irgun was led by a man named Menachem Begin, who would later become uh, prime minister. Uh, well, later that year, I should say, uh, when he was going to come to the United States, Albert Einstein and a number of other prominent Jewish figures uh, wrote a letter that was published in the New York Times, quite a famous letter. And it said, don't, don't let this guy in, he's a Nazi. I mean, can you imagine in 1947, one Jewish person calling another Jewish person a Nazi? You couldn't say anything more, uh, you know, indicting about somebody. 
but his group was the group that, that carried this out. Uh, a few days later, they were incorporated into the mainstream Zionist army, which was called the Haganah, and they became part of it. And then there was, there was really a killing spree that took place. Uh, the Israeli historian Ilan Pape has written a book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, where he says that up to two, there could have been up to 200 massacres that took place like they had seen. And many of them, it wasn't the whole population that was wiped out. Uh, men and boys of fighting age were being separated. Some would be shot, or uh, other survivors would be uh, loaded into trucks and driven to borders and dumped out. And after that was done a number of times, just the rumor that it was going to happen made people flee. People all expected the Palestinians who fled, and there, there was a myth about this that I grew up with, and maybe some of you did too, that the reason that the Palestinians left was that uh, they were told to by the kings, the, the monarchies, and that they would come back with the Arab armies. Uh, that, that, but, but that was, that's not what happened. The, the population was almost all farmers. Probably 85% were farmers. And farmers can't actually leave their farm and you know, come back at some unspecified future date. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the farm dies, you know, and everything falls apart. So the only way they could get, be forced to leave, and it would end up being 750,000 to 800,000 Palestinians did flee, was by means of terror. Um, and I think we should reference this today when we, uh, when we think about what's happening today, what's happening in Gaza today. And you know, how come, the, you know, the whole vocabulary that we, we have and that we, we are accustomed to, like, why isn't a pilot, you know, there's no air defenses in, in Gaza, and there hasn't been air defenses. Why does a pilot of a, of a high-tech warplane who drops 2,000 pound bombs on apartment buildings, why isn't that called terrorism? It's because it's the other side. I mean, and there's so much. It's like a gunman is a gunman is never a, 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 an Israeli soldier with a gun. It's a Palestinian with a gun because it's a derogatory term. But there's all that kind of work, all that kind of work out of the way. By the end of 1948, early 1949, uh, half of the population of uh, Palestinian Arab population had been. Uh, forced out of, from where they live. In the winter of 1948-49, thousands of people died of exposure. If people have seen from the early period, you know, the, the tents that were, you know, like the huge rows of tents where people were living, they didn't exist in 1948-49. That was later. Uh, so this was a completely, you know, unprepared expulsion of, as I said, half of the population, of Palestinian Arab population, uh, 750,000 people, and the uh, this is really this, this is the, the real story of, of what came about, and the uh, the role of the of the U.S. government was critical in this. Although the U.S. government di didn't immediately, there had a lot of conflict within the government over the relationship to the state of Israel, um, but they did force through the resolution of the United Nations that caught, that brought about what I said was the illegal partition. Uh, the four countries, they had to get two thirds at the UN, and four countries, Haiti, Liberia, Philippines, and Thailand, all said they were gonna vote against the resolution, and the resolution would have failed. But the US was able to put such heavy pressure on them particularly as states that were really near colonies of the United States. They weren't officially colonies. They were near colonies. That's, that's really how it passed. Two of them, they had all said they were going to vote no, and two of the ambassadors quit their jobs as ambassadors rather than be the ones who actually uh, cast the vote in favor of the partition. Um, but this is it. At the beginning, uh, the British left, and then I'm talking about now the beginning of the State of Israel, the British left it in 48. Uh, and for a period of time, it wasn't, there wasn't a great enthusiasm in the US for Israel. Uh, more came from, from uh, France. And France, now that the British were running, France for a period of about 15 years became the main armor 
uh, main, main weapons supplier for the state of Israel. Uh, in 1956, uh, and, and there was, a, I should say this, that there was a great hunger for land on the part of the, the, uh, the Zionist leaders, David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister of the state of Israel, which was proclaimed on May 14th of 1948. Uh, they were very unsatisfied and not, they had no intention at all to accept the 78% that they, that they got. It. But uh, said our borders, uh, Moshe Dayan, early in his career, Ben Gurion, others said yeah, our border has to be on the Jordan River at least. And then the others were saying, well, we shouldn't just have the West Bank, we should have the East Bank. Uh, and invoking some biblical passages or, you know, uh, to, to support that. But in 1956, Nasser, who was uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was the, prior, the leader then of the Arab National Movement that was just emerging, he was the first independent prime minister, president of Egypt. And in July of 1956, he nationalized the, oil, the Suez Canal, uh, and a waterway which entirely runs through his, uh, the country, Egypt but was the, had been controlled by the British and the French, and mainly by the British. Uh, and when he did that, by the way, the, uh, the New York Daily News, you know, a tabloid newspaper, had a big front page headline that said, the Hitler of the Nile, <laughs> talking about the, the vocabulary for nationalizing uh, a waterway that went through his own country, a Hitler. Uh, Israel organized with the British and French secretly, and they launched a war against Egypt after this happened. Just a few months, like three months later. It was organized in secret. Uh, they pretended that, uh, that they fomented this idea that, uh, that Egypt had attacked Israel. And that Israel did attack Egypt. And the British and the French weighed in on it. And it lasted for a few days. And the idea was going to be that the British would get back the Suez Canal. The French would have an end to the revolution that was going on in Algeria because it was being supported by Egypt. And Israel would conquer the West Bank and Gaza and the whole Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and maybe part of Lebanon. They talked about, you know, up to the Litani River. So they were forced to give up on that idea because the US and the, and the Soviet Union, for different reasons, the US saying to, the, to Britain and France, you didn't tell us, you know, you're our NATO partners, you didn't tell us you were doing this. And, you know, and, uh, you're not going to be the colonizers anymore. The new colonizer is coming. They didn't say that, of course, but that's what they meant. And for me, in the U.S., was going to become the dominant power in the Middle East. And the Soviet Union threatened to, uh, to go to war against, against uh, Britain and France if they didn't withdraw the troops, so they had to. That was 1956. In 1967, and as we document in the book, there was the Six-State War, which is coming up. And by the way, we're going to, I'll, I'll say, something else about it, but we're going to have a big demonstration on the anniversary of the Six-Day War in Washington uh, on June 8th. So it was in June of 1967. And this time, and again, it was presented to the world as if Israel had been attacked and was just fighting a defensive battle. But in reality, uh, Israel, as Moshe Dayan, who was an early prime minister, and Menachem Begin, the one who I mentioned before, uh, when he was prime minister, said, oh, you know that how we said that we were facing a dire threat and we had to, uh, we had to, to take action or else we would have been overrun? Both of them later said, no, that's not really what happened. Uh, it wasn't really true. And that is such a critical moment in this whole story because in the search for land, uh, Israel now conquered the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. Uh, and they conquered also the Sinai Peninsula, but had, they had to go back to Egypt in the peace negotiations later between those two countries. But that's how we got to today. That's how we got to uh, this situation. That's why Gaza is Gaza. Uh, and, and it's completely separated. I mean, Gaza is mentioned in the Bible. It goes back, goes back a long way. But the present circumstances were created by that war by the 1967 war. Uh, and, uh, and from the first days of it, 
the discussion in the Israeli cabinet, which is now quite well documented, the discussion in the Israeli cabinet was how to annex the land and not to annex the people. To annex the land without the people. In other words, how to get the Palestinian population out. This has been the aspiration from the beginning of this colonial enterprise. And I should say this, is that I, I, I don't want to talk too much more, and we can, I, I think we should have a discussion. But uh, two, other, two other things that I, I want to say about it is that, one, that that war also is the war that changed, transformed US policy toward Israel. And in the book, we quote Gerald Ford after the, after the Six Day War. Gerald Ford was then the House Minority Leader for the Republicans, later to become you know, uh, president. And he said, well, Israel has really done what we needed done, something to that effect. And why was that? That Israel attacked Egypt and Assyria and Jordan without, without warning. It destroyed their air forces on the ground. It uh, destroyed a lot of their troops formations as well. Uh, and they, uh, they carried out this, this war. And from the US point of view, this was advancing in Ford and, and, and Nixon, who will follow him, and John, I mean, all of them about this. This is great. This is great because uh, by, by uh, attacking the most important countries in the Arab world, Syria, which was then being called the Cuba of the Middle East, and Egypt, where Nasser was the most prominent Arab leader, that this would de-develop, help de the de-development of the Middle East, which is good for U.S. imperialism and U.S. Uh, US domin our global domination. So that took place at that time. And that's when Nixon came in the next year or he was elected the next year and came in in 1969. And Nixon, uh, and Nixon uh, and, uh, with Kissinger, of course, they initiated the, what came to be called the Nixon Doctrine. And the Nixon Doctrine, the idea of the Nixon Doctrine was that Israel would get vast amounts of weapons and money, and Iran, where the U.S. had put the Shah back on the throne in 1953, ushering in a quarter century of a horrific police state dictatorship in Iran. Why, do people, why are people in Iran angry at the United States? We just can't figure it out. So just, you know, how could that be? Um, so that, that, and the idea was that they should be on one end of the Middle East and on the other end, the controllers and the patrollers of the whole region uh, for the benefit of the United States, meaning that they should suppress national liberation movements, overthrow independent governments, or weaken them, or bring them down, and in exchange, uh, and why did why did it exchange they would get vast amounts of money, especially Israel? That's when Israel, let me go the money going to Israel went from the millions to the billions of dollars. point balance. I'm sorry. Was with the Nixon doctrine. And, uh, and, and so it's, that's been, so we have this, this pattern that took place and, and it's continued down until today, where the Zionist project had to have a sponsor at the beginning. And today, and I think that many people in Israel know this, many people in Washington know it too, they don't often say it, but they know it, and sometimes they do say it, is that Israel cannot be isolated. It has to have the backing of one of the big powers, of one of the major powers, in order to continue. And I think that's as true today, for different reasons, under different circumstances, as it was true back at the time of the Balfour Declaration. There had to be a sponsor, and it had to be one of the big powers uh, in order for the state of Israel to, to exist and to, to continue. So that puts, I think, a particular, puts uh, particular importance on what is going on inside the United States. If that is in fact true, and I think it is true, and I think it's, I think it's provable that without the support of the US, this camp, what we see going on in Gaza today, what we see going on all over Palestine, the brutality that, and, and have people been there? Has anybody been there? 
It's, it's unbelievable to, to go to the West Bank, or I, or I went to Gaza, or going to the West Bank. The treatment of the Palestinians, I mean, it's like the day-to-day -day oppression, aside from what we're seeing in Gaza today, I mean, where you have to go, in the West Bank, you have to go through a checkpoint to go to work or to go to school. And when you go through the checkpoint, any 19-year-old soldier, and a lot of them are extremely racist, uh, uh, can stop you, take you out of line, question you, beat you, shoot you, and if that, they don't shoot you, there'll be an investigation. And the investigation is always leading to the same place, which is nowhere. So you have this, this going on, and it be, what is going on, and especially what is going on in Gaza now, uh, that can't be going on without the U.S. And so for people in the U.S. who think, who stand for justice, we have to, uh, we have to energetically uh, take action against what we're seeing happen. The last thing I want to say really is, uh, is to say, well, so why does the U.S. give this vast amount of money? I mean, that was a long time ago, the Nixon Doctrine. The Nixon Doctrine ended because the Shah's government was overthrown. Uh, that was the end of the, you know, that one. But Israel continues to patrol the region. They, 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 on a daily basis, they bombed Damascus, the, the Damascus airport. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, the, you know, it becomes like this routine. Oh yeah, they bombed, uh, you know, four people were killed. And it's like, it, it's been normalized. That kind of that kind of those reports have been have been normalized. What Israel has done in exchange, and I, I, I give this point with Mearsheimer and Walt. I don't know if people know those names, Mearsheimer. And they were a book called The Israel Lobby. And what I said about it is, I, I think it's a very useful book. It has a lot of useful information in it. Uh, but its fundamental thesis is, I believe, incorrect. And that is that it's mainly the Israeli lobby that determines what. Uh, what happens. Now, I don't discount our co great Congress people in Washington. If you wave money in front of them, you know, they'll, they'll follow you anywhere. As long as it's not interfering with their breakfast and lunch with donors. Uh, so, you know, the, you, you can't, you can't dis, you know, discount the role of money. But there's something more that Israel has done. I mean, the people in Washington are investors, basically. And, they, and uh, we've seen so many things that Israel has done on the, for the, what are considered the best interests of U.S. foreign policy, which has nothing to do with us. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not our foreign policy. But in 1983, just one example is when the U.S. aid to Guatemala was cut off. And it was cut off because it became known to the whole world that there was genocide going on in Guatemala against the Mayan people. And it was inconvenient for the U.S. to keep doing that, to keep arming them and training their soldiers. Israel came in and did it. In 1979, Israel collaborated with South Africa, and it was very close to the apartheid regime in South Africa and Rhodesia, as it used to be called Zimbabwe today. Uh, it was a great friend of those governments in the 1970s and, and the 1980s, not Zimbabwe anymore because they had that they got rid of the government. But in 1979, Israel collaborated with South Africa and gave South Africa the atomic bomb. That's how they got the, the atomic bomb. They, the French gave the atomic bomb to Israel. I didn't mention that before. When they were the main sponsors of, of, of Israel from a military point of view, they gave Israel the means by which to develop the atomic bomb, the technology and the materials to use at the Demona plant. Uh, so now Israel, now Israel gives it to South Africa. And there's a lot of other, Israel intervened on the side of, uh, of, of the Chilean fascist center. Uh, and, and it was just carrying out this horrific you know, reign of tor uh, torture and murder after the overthrow of, of Allende. Um, but where it's really had the worst impact at all, and I think this is, I referred to earlier, it not being of the region, it has been, a, it's been a, a something that was planted in the region, in the heart of the region. Like, you look at Palestine and the world map, it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's very strategic because it's a transfer, it's a crossing point between Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so it's, 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 a, it's a very important, uh, it's, a, it's a very important country in that, in that respect as well as others. But the, 
the effect that Israel was not really there. It was really, it was really following another direction, and it was following uh, both the direction of Washington, uh, which wants to see its interests protected, but also its own interest in being the only military power, strong military power in the region. So it's had a very, you know, and, and it's considered, Israel is considered to be different than, uh, than, than the other regimes in the region. You know what, there's all these monarchies that are, are all our friends. All right, but I mean, what are, what's going on with family monarchies in 2024? You know, I mean, but, but uh, they're all willing, like back, take back rain, for instance, back rain uh, in, the, in the Persian Gulf, so the fifth fleet is headquartered. The government wants to be friends with the U.S., the, the, the king, and wants to be friends with Israel. And, you know, that's all fine. But the U.S. doesn't regard them as really stable in the way they regard Israel as being stable. Because if the people of Bahrain had their way, and they tried two years ago, they would overthrow the government and stop having these uh, the accords with the state of Israel. So they're viewed as not really stable. US, the U.S. leaders view Israel in a different kind of way. So even though they have disagreements with them, like they're having disagreements right now, because uh, on the one hand, you have uh, you know, the, Israel carrying out this, this offensive, uh, and, and really genocidal offensive, tens of thousands. I mean, oh, there's probably more than 50,000 people actually dead, Palestinians. And, 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 and uh, probably an equal number that are wounded. So this is going on, and Israel wants land. Uh, like I said before, it has not given the up since the beginning. Wants to have larger territory. They want to take back Gaza. The current government has said, uh, the leading minister has said they want it. And, and also we have Jared Kushner, Kushner uh, you know, the son-in-law of uh, uh, Trump saying, Oh, it would be really a very nice waterfront ter territory. Uh, uh, so you have them, you know, uh, uh, really carrying this out. Um, so the the, la the very last thing I want to say is this: is that this relationship has to be it really needs to be understood as the as the relationship for what it really is. That uh, and and. Uh, you know, it's a relationship that is a deadly relationship at this point, and it has been a deadly relationship since the since the beginning. Um, I, I quote in the uh, in the book um, we reprinted actually the uh, an article from 1969 called "Israel Based on Western Imperialism." Uh, the uh, author is an Egyptian historian, Abdul Wahab Al Nasiri. A very highly respected uh, European uh, Egyptian historian, and he recounts that he was teaching at Rutgers University in 1960, 1968, and he asked a student who was from the Peace Party in Israel at the time, they called the Malpam Party. He asked him, "Why is Israel supporting the United States in Vietnam?" And the student replies, "Israel must defend itself." So that was what we were thinking about a little bit. It must defend itself? What, it, Vietnam is about to attack Israel? No. It means that that relationship, that essential relationship with one of the great powers, means that you have to really be with that country in, in, in its critical moments. That Moshe Dayan would go to you know, visit the US troops. And what was he doing visiting the US troops in Vietnam? And so this is the, you know, the, the reality of the situation is that the myth that the Zionist movement is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. And that is that's an, a great insult, I think, to Jewish people. Uh, it, it's, that's not what it is. It cannot have been dependent from its beginning on British imperialism, French imperialism, US imperialism, and be a national liberation movement. Those are mutually contradictory things. So I'll stop with that. Talking quite so long. Yeah, I wrote something.
question a while ago, back at the time of the Iraq war, about how did the U.S. first get involved in Iraq? And Iraq was, of course, one of those countries. Until 1958, until the revolution in 1958, it was a British neo-colony. But in 1927, after 10 years of, or eight years of debate after the end of World War I, there was a resolution reached in regard to Iraq's oil. And Iraq's oil was divided up so that uh, 27, uh, let me uh, get it right, it's about, about 23.75% uh, of Iraq's oil went to Britain, France, uh, Holland, Netherlands, and the United States, and 5% went to the guy who brokered the deal, who was known in history as Mr. 5%er. Uh, and the point about that is that this is also part of the formation of the modern Middle East, along with the Sykes-Picot Treaty, the Belfort Declaration, the 1927 Red Line Agreement, uh, and, and it was so, until this revolution in 1958, Iraq got 0% of Iraq's oil. I mean, you know, why would people be angry in other countries <laughs> uh, with this kind of treatment? Well, so I'm wondering, um, like, I, I guess I have a perception of <clears throat> a lot of um, people in the United States, um, like, definitely contemporarily and in the last past, like, several decades um, being predominantly affiliated with like evangelical Christianity. Um, and uh, I was wondering if that was something you could speak on a little bit, like that link between American evangelical Christianity and Zionism. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, <clears throat> which has a long history in the, in the US. Where Jill and I grew up was about 25 miles from where the Mormons started. And they were part of one of the many organizations of the Great Awakening, the building the New Jerusalem. But those were people, they were a bit different. Was that? Hmm? Where was that? Uh, oh, Palmyra, New York. It's a, where Hill Cumorah is. And Hill Cumorah is where the angel brought the tablets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so there were all kinds of, but that's not what we're really talking about here. The modern, that's why I wanted to make clear at the beginning to say, we're talking about political Zionism. The political Zionism that became a political movement uh, uh, early on. But so now you have a different base of support for the state of Israel that has been very strongly encouraged, which is the, the um, <clears throat> you know, the born again Christian movement, the, uh, Christian nationalist movement that supports, and they become, they as a group are more solidly supporting Israel today than the Jewish community. There's big divisions inside the Jewish community, including, you know, among, particularly among youth, but not only, not exclusively among youth. But their leaders are, are treated, you know, they, they, uh, the Israeli government welcomes them, brings them, puts them up in five star hotels, you know, takes them on these lavish tours, gives them presents, probably gives them money. I don't know all that they, they get out of it. But it's so cynical on the part of the Israeli government because the story of these groups is that if Jesus will come back, you know, the battle of Armageddon will take place, uh, and, and, and then there'll be seven years of peace, and then everybody doesn't believe what the, what the Christians, this particular variant of Christians believe, they're going to hell including all the Jewish people are going down. So I mean, it's like, but, but uh, they don't care. I mean, Netanyahu, you, I mean, Netanyahu, Trump, uh, I mean, Biden too. I mean, they're all so cynical, they're such cynical characters. They'll, they'll do anything and accept anything. So I think that that, but, but uh, that's an important constituency. You know, I, I, I should have just popped into my head because I said I'm oh, good. But I was at the Janine, uh, the city of Janine, Janine refugee camp in 2002. After the Israelis, it was uh, second intifada. They destroyed the, they bulldozed and blew and it blew up the refugee camp in the middle of it. And but you could stand up above that and stand by the mosque and you could look right into this uh, valley that is uh, where Armageddon is supposed to take place. It's the Valley of Megiddo. And it's really the richest land in all of Palestine. And so, and many of the people in Janine, they used to be their land. It was their family's land. 
So when people, you know, people advise them sometimes, oh, we forget about the right of return, and you know, I mean, they're living, in, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are living in refugee camps, and they have no way out. And you know, like it's, a, it's like they want to go back, they want to return, they have a right, of, right of return, they have the right to return. Their property, their land was stolen from them by means of violence. And despite the UN Resolution 194, and later in 1948. Uh, after the, uh, the formation of this Israel State said, all the refugees must be allowed to return and be compensated for their losses. And so, you know, that's, that's another aspect of that. Given this history, is there any hope of disentangling, of Biden getting out of this, or at least finding a way out? It's a mess. Well, if you don't have hope, you got to just give up, right? So. <laughs> And it's, the prospects right now, I mean, it's a very, very terrible situation that exists right now. It's the worst situation that's existed uh, since 1948 for the Palestinians. Uh, and in some ways, it's even worse uh, in some aspects of, you know, the, the deliberate denial of medicine, of food, um, there's very widespread hunger and uh, malnourishment. And, and the bombing just keeps happening. And they just keep talking about they're going to investigate. I mean, they're, 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 they're going to investigate. They know what's going on. I mean, the latest, uh, it happened right at the end of the conference we were in, uh, the, the bombing of Rafa with these you know, huge flames shooting out and 45 people said to be killed, probably far more than that. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening now. Um, so we have to, and we, because of, the fact that it is the, the U.S. that it backs this. I mean, they made, as of a month ago, they had made 28 emergency shipments of ammunition, and they made bombs from the United States. I mean, this is an area that, 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 that Gaza has, as I said before, it has no air defenses. I mean, the, the, the planes that are flying over, they can, you know, they can shoot down drones or something like that, but there's no, there's no defense against uh, you know the, these high really high tech warplanes. So um, we have to keep raising our voices. We have to, as I said, on June eighth, which will be what anniversary is it? Of, uh, it's the 50, 57th anniversary of the Six Day War, which took place in early June of 1967, and it also uh, mark. Um, eight months since the, the uh, massive bombing campaign began. So people are gonna to go to Washington. Maybe you can, maybe some people are gonna go. We have to get to the right thing to do. Yes. So thank you so much for your remarks this evening. It's been yeah. very, very interesting. Uh, it sounds like the role of oil really had nothing to do with these this early accords. Um, I think it's in 1917. Balfour Declaration and the other one. Um, and, but yet, oil did come, did come, like, you can't speak to the history of petroleum as well. Um, well, there's a lot of history, of course. It has a huge history. But I wouldn't say it's unimportant. In a certain way, because the focus of US foreign policy right now is shifting from West Asia to East Asia, and, and, and there's kind of a, there's a very disturbing, I would say, underlying normalization of the idea that war with China is coming. Uh, that's, I mean, we can talk about the catastrophe, the catastrophe. Uh, but, so, uh, the Middle East remains very important. Oil remains very important. Um, at the beginning, uh, as I said, the, the, the way the U.S. got involved really in the Middle East in a serious way, even though there are no U.S. troops that fought in the Middle East in World War I, was that red line agreement that took place 10 years later that, eventually, that essentially divided Iraq's oil up five different ways, none of, the, none of which were Iraq. And then there was 1932, there was the creation of the state of Saudi Arabia. It did not exist before that. Uh, and it really literally means the Arabia of the Al Saud family. That's one family, that huge country with vast oil resources is uh, because of uh, that US intervention in the 1930s, 
the uh, Ad, uh, Ramco Oil Company, the U.S.-based oil company in Saudi Arabia, and the U.S. Embassy were in the same building in, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty gruesome history, uh, every way you look at it. And, but uh, so it's not that oil has been uh, it's not important. It's been very important. It's very it's very essential. In the middle of World War II. Um, uh, there was an exchange of letters between Roosevelt and Churchill. Uh, and we should say more about Churchill because he was so bad. So, uh, but uh, the, and the exchange of letters was Churchill writes to Roosevelt and says, I'm glad to hear you're not making sheep's eyes, a term I had never before, heard before I read this, on our holdings in, uh, in Iraq, just as we are not looking that way upon yours in Saudi Arabia. In other words, of course, they knew that they were making sheep size at it, that they wanted, that the U.S., at the end of the war, uh, which is a very interesting story and contrary to the, you know, the, the way it's presented to us, at the end of the war, the U.S., uh, Washington was intent on stripping the key elements of the British Empire from the British Empire and taking them over, not in a formal colonial sense, but in a neo-colonial sense. So it was extremely, the fact that they were writing this before the Normandy invasion, we're having a discussion about all embassies, all US embassies in the world are directed to see what oil concessions our, our oil companies can get. I mean, I, when I read that, I was like, what? You know, the, the war is not won. It wasn't close to being won yet. And they're already talking about like how we're, you know, how we're conquering new oil fields. So oil has been very, very important. Um, in you know, in, in Iran, what, I mentioned the overthrow of the Shah of Iran. So the British and the, and the U.S. intelligence services collaborated to overthrow the Sh the Mossadegh uh, government, the first elected government in in um, in Iran's history, and put the Shah, the so-called King of Kings, who was some phony anyways, to put him on, on the throne to serve U.S. interests. And right after they overthrew them, the New York Times had an editorial, and the editorial said, uh, well, now this will be a good lesson for other uh, developing nations uh, that want to engage in resource nationalism. That's the New York Times, the, 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 you know, the official voice. In other words, if, if a country wants to use its resources for, if a country of the third world, as it was sometimes called then, or the developing world, wanted to use their resources for their own people, for their own, the benefit of their own country, you know, you will overthrow you. You know, so here's your lesson, you'll get overthrown. I mean, they didn't always succeed in overthrowing them, but that's really gets to the essence of what imperialism means. Imperialism has no concern, the imperialist countries have no concern for the, uh, for the, the, the rights of, of people there or the rights of people here. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's all been a mythological presentation. But oil, oil was very important, oil continues to be very important today. I think that right now though, as I said, the focus of US foreign policy and one of the reasons that the Biden administration wants to calm things down to some degree about the Middle East is that they're shifting their focus to East Asia. But what, the U what, what Israel is doing is creating great anger. And I would say one of the difference, I think, that a big difference between the US and Israel is that Israel wants land, as I said. They want to force out the, the, the Palestinian population and take more land. The U.S. is managing a worldwide empire. It's even a bigger empire than the British have. Like not in formal colonies, but nobody ever had 800 military bases around the world. <laughs> what do they do on there? No, I remember that they are. Are you saying then that the U.S. does not want a two-state solution? It seems to me the two-state solution is the solution. Does the U.S. want a two-state solution? Yes. I think they would like to have a two-state solution, but they can't figure out where the second state would go at this point. <laughs> you know, there's so much, there's so much, uh, there's so many settlements. And, and with the, with the um, understanding of, from Washington's point of view, of what the two-state solution would be, and this is why, it, and, and, and really all it says about it, is that it would be, it could have a police force, but it couldn't have a military. The, the second state. 
And, and we have to agree the way, you know, the Oslo Accord, um, which was in 1993, the Oslo Accord, I read the Oslo Accord. It was like a really painful thing to do, a test to undertake, but because it, it, it goes through, it's like hundreds of pages long. And it goes through all, every detail about it, like how melons get transported to Jordan. And I mean, it, like, there's all these details, meaning that, you know, there's no such document as the Oslo Accord for the United States of America or Israel that, that, uh, that, that outlines everything you can do and can't do. Uh, and uh, and, and to, to talk about a state having a state of Palestine, um, and some Palestinians would welcome it. I think many of them would welcome a, a, a second state, but they wouldn't necessarily say, well, that's the end of the struggle. But they would welcome having a second state, and it would be better than what's going on now. But uh, it would be a colonial, it, it, it would be from Washington and, 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 you, and Israel point of view, it would have to be basically a, a, a new colony of Israel. Other than informing people about what's happened over the years, since 3,000 years ago. And I know you want people to buy your book, of course, but what, what's your solution? What, do, do you have a solution in your book? If you could summarize that. Well, uh, we have a number of uh, appendices to the book. Uh, one of them I mentioned already. Another one is an interview with uh, a, a leader who's still in prison all these years later, Ahmed al-Sadat. Uh, and that's a bad, I'm saying the wrong name. Yeah, and, and he was the leader of the Popular Front, which is the, uh, or one time the second largest organization. It's still a very significant organization. And, and also by Palestinian activists here, and where they say we would, we would accept having a, a second state, you know, and uh, but their aspiration is for one state with democratic rights for all people. Uh, they they say that is a the, the um, two state is a transitional idea. We've been very careful about like because we're here and we're in, in the interest of you know of self determination. We don't. I've tried to be very careful about what we say, what the solution is. But having said that, I, I, I don't see what the solution can be except one state with democratic rights for all people. The problem is we're very far away from that. The situation is very far away. Uh, the public opinion polls in Israel are very, very disturbing. They're very, very negative. Uh, and a big majority of the people would not live in the same apartment building with, a, with an Arab. I mean, that's in the 1948 borders. I mean, it's, and, uh, and among the youth, it's worse. Uh, among the Israeli youth, it's, it's, it's uh, a lot of, they have a big following for a couple of people who are really fascist in the, in the government. The Minister of Finance, who also has a portfolio for the West Bank named uh, Smotrich, Alazo Smotrich, and then the other, Itamir Benghis Kabir, who's the Minister of Na uh, uh, National Security. And he, um, the, uh, he has control of the prisons, and there, there's like day in, day out torture going on in Palestinian prisoners. There's 10,000 of them. It's a horrific situation right now, but I think in the end, I don't see how, you know, it's an apartheid state also. You know, I mean, one of the things that was amazing to me was, uh, anyway, uh, there's at least 20 major Palestinian, Israeli, international, U.S. human rights organizations have documented in great detail how uh, the ways in which Israel is an apartheid state. And there's many, many, many. Uh, and then the, the Congress of the United States back in November voted 412 to 9 that Israel is not an apartheid state. I mean, okay, so, you know, next they can vote that the Earth, you know, is the center of the universe. The sun goes around the Earth, not the other way around. I mean, you can, they can it's just such an incredible thing. But it is an apartheid state. And, and I say that because I don't believe any apartheid state can last forever. I remember being, in, I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement for, for years. And you know everybody thought, well, how can this end? 
because there's so much power of the South African military and they're backed by the US and they're backed by the British. But at least from the point of view of the legal system, it did change. And afterwards, there was a, a South African activist uh, who actually I found out later was actually uh, uh, quoting Rosa Luxemburg, essentially, from 100 years ago, saying, every revolution is impossible until it happens. And then it was always inevitable. Uh, <laughs> right, how could it happen? But let me just say something before we close. And, and people have a chance to buy books if they like to. But I want to say, here in 1920, there's a, 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 another great mythology is that you know, Winston Churchill, a great friend of Roosevelt, you know, hugging each other on battleships and all that kind of thing. Uh, and it's supposed to be a great hero of ours, too. But he wrote in 1920 for London's Illustrated Sunday Herald, he offered his point of view. He said, from the days of Spartacus to those of Karl Marx and down to Trotsky in Russia, Balikun in Hungary, Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, and Emma Goldman in the United States, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization. Does that, does that sound like anything people have heard before? <laughs> So this, that's the that's the line of the of the uh, anti-Semites, right? I mean, it's the most anti-Semitic line. It's like, and somehow the overthrow of civilization. So the French Revolution, the Spartan slaves rising rising up, you know, workers rising up, poor people rising up all over. That's from Winston Churchill's point of view was the worst thing that could be you could imagine. And it goes on, and he has a section. It's called. Uh, oh, and the article, uh, the overall article is called um, Good Jews and Bad Jews. And it continued in a section titled Terrorist Jews. There, there is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and the actual bringing about of the revolution by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. Uh, it says, Zionism offers the third sphere to the political conception of the Jewish race, in violent contrast to international communism. Zionism has already become a factor in the political convulsions. The struggle which is, and I'm skipping a lot, which is now beginning between the Zionist and Bolshevik Jews is little less than a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. So that's Winston Churchill. I mean, a really an extreme anti-Semite and whose idea is that we can use the Zionist movement. And Winston Churchill, by the way, was managing the counter-revolution in Russia that was going on with the 14 armies that went ahead and the white armies inside the country and all of that. But, so that was his idea of why Zionism was a good idea. It's, you know, we can, it, it can be used against everyone who's fighting for revolution and progress, uh, but we should still worship them. Mm -hmm. Thank you.